Thank you very much indeed, Mami. Uh, thank you to you also and uh, the Biennale for inviting me here. It's the first time we've been back to Australia since 2010. And, and I'm really impressed by your Biennale, but also about the archival side of it. And this really shows what an amazing impact and the true importance of the Biennale here in Sydney. And uh, going through the documents and the catalogues, and, and I really sincerely hope that unless it is your curatorial intention that there should be no catalogue for this Biennale, one will indeed appear, even if in only e-form, but preferably a life and flesh, blood and bone version. It's very important for now, and it's very important for the future because there seem to be Biennales and Triennales popping up all over Australia now. And this is the first, and it's got the strength it's got the core, and long may it grow and get stronger. So, I'm going to talk about my background, as I was asked, and how the Sydney Biennale fitted into that, and uh, come up with the title Ghosts and Stories, thinking about Biennales and other big contemporary art exhibitions. Because I think there's many overlaps between Biennales and, and other big shows, but there are one or two crucial differences, which I'll talk about a little later. But let's begin at the beginning. Well, for an exhibition of contemporary art, I believe there's no platonic ideal. There's no single perfect show. You can parachute down anywhere it'll work. OK, if you're going to do a Moliani retrospective, sure, that's a, that's a closed matter. But about contemporary art, people, places, histories, and ghosts, matter. Because they're in a Manichaean struggle between ideas, conditions, things we find it difficult to name, understand, or recognize. Why and how does contemporary art matter? Hi, there's the rub. Start in 1970. I was a just finishing that year as a student at the uh, University of Durham, and I was studying history. The reason I'd gone up there was that it was in, well, the reason I'd gone up there was that I was in complete crisis when I left school. I uh, managed to escape when I was 17, and I worked in the theater. And I'd imagined since the age of 10 that I would either be an actor or a theater director. I worked in the theater, real theater, for six months, realized I did not like actors, and it was not my world. <laughs> and I really didn't know what to do with myself. And I was lucky enough to be offered a place to study history at this beautiful medieval city. And I remember still that sunset on the day I went up for my interview. But more importantly, it was right close to the minefields, the first uh, coal mining fields in, in the UK, uh, which were still working at that time. And the miners there had their own culture, their own patois, their own way of speaking, their own dress, their own songs and music. But it was the 60s, time of 68. I was left, of course, quite radical, but I just couldn't convince myself that a union of peasants, workers, and students would be able to run anything. And in fact, that violent revolution was no way forward. But I could see that there was stories in the past that were important. And for various complicated reasons, I started to study uh, German art of the 1920s and before then, and made this exhibition in my final year, which is called Germany and Ferment, Art and Society in Germany, 1900 to 1935. And it was really because as a kid, when my mother took me to the dentist, there was a museum up the road, and she used to take me in there as a consolation prize. And it was the only place in Britain that you could actually see early 20th century German art. And these are some of the works that were in the exhibition I did, and I borrowed many others. But somehow, they just seemed so much more immediate, so much stronger than the British stuff. I wasn't much interested in British art at that time became so later. And there's a kind of amazing Oedipal moment 
before, during, and after the Second World War, First World War, which of course ended in tragedy. Yet part of that tragedy was that the fascist ideal, and I later learned that it was also became the Stalinist ideal, that art that mattered, what I thought was good art, was anathema to it. And I thought, well, if this is called degenerate by Hitler, I can't get enough of it. This will be my life. So from 1976 to 1996, I was director of the Museum of Modern Art Oxford. And there I got an education. I was 27 when I got the job. I realized I knew very little about art. I had been to the Courtauld. I uh, had worked with some artists, but... Uh, and, and you go along with, the, you know, with what's, what's happening to an extent, trying to discriminate what you think is really good. Still the time, the very time of the end of the avant-garde, these successive moments of uh, conceptualism, minimalism, povera. Uh, and it was all just about to implode. And looking at the art world and having to make decisions about what exhibitions I was going to do, it wasn't enough to thumb through the pages of Art Forum or of Art Monthly. I really had to feel that I believed in these things. And looking around me, I mean, th there was a lot of uh, emerging women artists at that time, but, but looking around me, it, it was increasingly the, the, West, the art world, what we call the art world, and modern art world, because modern and contemporary were the same there, was a white boys' club belonging to Western Europe and North America, with a bit of Australia thrown in if you were lucky. You'd have to be very lucky at that time. So, it struck me that if, uh, if one's going to show work on the basis that you really believe it's good, that this is an impossibly small gene pool. And so in that 20 years, I started to spread out of that into Asia, into what was then still the Soviet Union, into Latin America and Africa, and to test and learn and show work and to create a common platform on which Jackson Pollock or Donald Judd or Carl Andre could be shown with K.G. Subramanian, with Mrinalini Mukherjee, with artists of Maconde culture, with Jose Clemente Orozco. It seemed to me to be the only sensible thing to do. In 1955, it was not closure, but there was a a development in the story which had started in, in Durham uh, 25 years earlier, in that I was one of the co-curators of Art and Power, Europe Under the Dictators. And I was both curating and writing about the art in uh, particularly Germany and the Soviet Union, but also Italy at this time, between 1930 and 45. And uh, during that, I began to realize that uh, that what these dictators hated so much was what we could roughly describe as modernism or a kind of auto autonomic art, an art which is free and independent. But certainly, sure as hell, they were modern. So just to characterize it, what they hated was modernism, but they were modern. And they're modern in the same way that ISIS and Al-Qaeda are modern today now. They're not medieval or anything. That kind of fascism and fundamentalism is part of our life today. So, 1998, <coughs> I moved from Oxford <coughs> and go to Stockholm. So it was 96. But this is the first show that opened. Head of the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art and decided to make this show called Wounds Between Democracy and Redemption in Contemporary Art. Well, of course, Sweden, very proud of its Swedish model, its democratic model in which everyone has rights. But my God, does that create conflict? And redemption, the idea that there's a kind of spiritual and redemptive act in good art, which many people find extremely contentious indeed. But still, I think it's important. So here are some ghosts. Sorry about the spacing, it's not down here. Um, St. Thomas, the man who put his fingers into the side of Christ, and by doing that, by that experience, he found that what everything he believed, what everything he knew was turned on its head. 
So an analogy for opening a new museum, a new museum building, that for art itself. You can talk about it, you read about it in magazines, only by experiencing it directly can you know what it is. And you have the right to make up your own view about that. Martin Luther, everyone thinks Sweden is out without religion. It actually is, uh, is, is quite a uh, subliminally Lutheran place. And that sense of guilt is very strong. Sigmund Freud, the man who came out, up with the idea that creativity, even art itself, is based in trauma, in wounds, and that this is a kind of healing. And then Ingmar Bergman, who was not a ghost then, he was very much alive, but thinking of his, uh, his sardonic early films, full of self-loathing, misery, and humor, he was a very good state to have, we hoped, on our side. So the impulses that we wanted to do in this exhibition, because it wasn't a biennale, it was a one to reopen, relaunch the museum after a, after a rather fallow period, examine different ideas of what it meant to buy modern and contemporary and how they relate to the present. And I'll come on to that in a second. To showcase and critique the existing collection of the museum. To build, been built up by Ponto Sultan, who did an amazing job, but it had already become iconic, fetishized, and there were huge gaps. To indicate artists' works and concerns for the future programs of the museum and its collection. To create ways of looking at and thinking about art that are new, challenging, and constructive. And then to probe the strengths and weaknesses of the new building and its surroundings. Uh, very important indeed. Art takes place in places, and those places matter. 173 works by over 70 artists, beginning with the European Enlightenment. What else? <clears throat> the fount of modernity, the time when those ideas of human rights that developed uh, actually came into the idea of the autonomy of ind individual art as an autonomous field, and the necessity for the artist to be a conscience, a conscience to the world. So Jake Chapman and Dinos Chapman's The Disasters of War, these uh, small children's toys, which are in fact replicas of Goya's famous engravings. And in, the, in its way, making a comment about uh, how these uh, fine ideals had somehow become fetishized, infantilized by repetition and by non-observance. That's really the first wall that you saw when you went into the, the museum. And uh, on the left is uh, Edvard Munch, in the middle Richard Hamilton, on the right Theodore Jericho. So Jericho's uh, Tête de Capité, these were studies for the raft of the Medusa, impossible to borrow, unfortunately. Uh, but his, his uh, his important salon painting, which denounced not only the slave trade, but also the corruption of the Bourbon royalist government that had taken over after the Napoleonic era. So a work of great, uh, of great moral acuity, but also great fervor and cruelty. Edvard Munch's, his version of the death of Marat. Now in this, uh, it's a kind of infantilized version of a revolutionary icon. He plays the part of Mara, not in his bath, but on his bed. That is his lover standing there. They've had a god-awful row, and he got so out of control with himself that he shoot it, shot himself in the hand, not in the foot. But uh, the fact that he makes this a, a series of works, uh, and this is one of the paintings from it, uh, it, it, it really showing how the, the revolutionary, the public icon has turned back in on itself into a kind of uh, psychotic spasm. Different spasm here, really Richard Hamilton, the state, it's one of a series of works he made about the troubles in Northern Ireland. Of course, the other one most well known is, uh, is The Citizen, which shows Bobby Sands standing in a blanket, having made his dirty protest in the, in the U-block prisons. But this of, of naked power. Britain, one of the, the havens of Magna Carta and the freedom, and this happening in 1993, a police state. Never reported that way in British newspapers. It still isn't. 
So following this idea about the origins of, uh, of modernity in the, uh, in the Enlightenment, in the times of the Revolution, uh, we're really seeing how contemporary artists measured up to this. So Ian Hamilton Finley, his guillotine blades with texts by Diderot, Poussin, Poussin, Robespierre, and himself. It's a conjunction you don't often see uh, of Bacon with uh, Andy Warhol. There's a car crash there. Bacon, different uh, self-portraits. Sorry, portraits. Gerhard Richter's work from the 70s, looking back at old, um, old uh, photographs, families, his own family, his uncle Rudy, who was a member of the Wehrmacht, That's a Dick Bengtsson on the right-hand side there, an important Swedish artist. He's, he's done a pastiche of an Edward Hopper painting and then stuck a swastika in the corner. Uh, people always asked him why he did that. He never quite said why. But I think it had something to do with uh, Sweden's pseudo-neutrality in World War II and its failure ever to own up to that. Another painting by him showing these wandering youngsters with their knapsacks on the back good Aryan youth, yet there's a Kandinsky and a Mondrian and a Rothko. And very strange pictures about modernity and modernism. And then this monster, um, George Basel, it's an amazing uh, painting of one of the biggest of the Helden Builder, the, the hero pictures, which is his kind of pathetic version of socialist realism. He grew up under socialist realism in the, in the East, and he, he, he transposes it not to the factory, the growing economy, uh, but into a wasteland where these two, two friends, the Grossenfreunde, are trying to make contact with each other in their alienation with the flag having long fallen, and their, and their clothes are spattered with paint. Boyce's uh, attempt here in this particular work to, uh, to heal the still fractured Germany, to bring the East and the West together. Or this by Kunelis. Liberta o muerte, liberty or death. Long live Mara, long live Robespierre. It's a real candle there. Now, we had... Uh, Pierre Luigi Tatti was working with me on the, on the uh, curatorship of this show. <coughs> we spoke spoken with Cornelis, and we really wanted to show this work. It had something, I think, with testing the limits of the building. And uh, he'd agreed. And we had the ponies coming up uh, from a circus in Malmo to us when, when Cornelis arrived. He walked into the room, and he said, Oh, you didn't tell me there was a Louise Bourgeois in the room. We said, oh, yes, we did. Here's the plan. You see that big thing? It's a Louise Bourgeois. And he said, ah, uh, I want to do something with flesh. So we're left with a very big problem, well, a very big hole. Uh, I was dealing with the uh, sprinkler system that had just gone off three days before the uh, opening of the building. So we were evacuating uh, uh, artworks out of it. So I said to Tati, please, you speak with him and see what we can come up with. So we agreed that we would make a work about flesh. And actually, it is probably better than having the real ponies there. And uh, this grid is the size of Picasso's Guernica. One of the uh, big images in that is a screaming horse. And uh, on it is hung horse meat. I think we had to change it three or four times during the scope of the exhibition. It was all done very humanely. It went to Stockholm Zoo, but it did keep dripping on the beautiful new floor. So the edict went out that the blood drips should be allowed to remain. Larry Clark, this was in the collection of the, uh, of the museum. And we put this in a small naval prison, which is actually next to the museum, because, again, we were testing the building and using bits and bobs around it on the island of Skepsholm, where it's situated. Diane Arbus, also. 
So all these little wounds keep on cropping up from different places. Yeah, breakfast time in Richard Billingham's household. And Christian Boltanski, from wonderful archives borrowed from Inessa Handeles. I mean, they, uh, they're kind of records of some crime. Sometimes they're tied into the Holocaust, the missing faces of people, but not so specifically. We just know that there's awful lack of the people who are depicted here, and we don't know why or where they've gone. Kabakov, the man who flew into space from his apartment. Victor Gripo, an artist very active during the years of lead in Argentina, uh, when the colonels were dropping people out of helicopters. Uh, sort of terrible time. And he made this work in Argentina there about the tortures. It's, it's called Analog. And what it is, it's a potatoes. It's a table full of potatoes, and they're wired up to an amateur. So as the starch deteriorates in the potatoes, you, you can read off the uh, electric charge. So it's quite oblique in that way, but certainly very readable to anyone knowing the situation. And a very strange and poetic work. Equally strange are Doris Salcedo's, these uh, old pieces of furniture which are full of concrete and floating in the concrete, barely touching the surface, uh, clothing and buttons, signs of humans in there. Again, referring to the disappeared people in Colombia during the same time. And certainly one of these was bought by the museum as a result. Willie Doherty, going back to Northern Ireland from a slightly different, the other side perspective, a series of photographs which were added to the museum collection. Mr. Hurst, who wasn't. Uh, Renica Dijkstra. These works are actually shown in the education studios, a whole series of portraits of very fragile, vulnerable young people she found in Poland. And then a bit of show business to end the show. Uh, Vanessa Beecroft, a performance she made at the opening, which was, came through with, with videos. It's, a, it's based on a Helmut Newton fashion photograph. So it's her, her kind of ironization of that, always using women from the environment. So it's an ironization of Swedish femin, feminist, feminhood, womanhood itself. So now jump to 2010 in Sydney for a Biennale. And um, I think that uh, the same concerns with modernity uh, uh, continue. But Biennales happen every two years. Uh, and I think there is a, is a duty to concentrate, at least on contemporary art. I mean, not within the two-year framework, but at least within the 10-year the, the framework of, of the now and also their, their, their places, and they're identified as places. And I really wanted to look at um, the condition of how things were now. The title, The Beauty of Distance, um, oops, sorry, Songs of Survival in a Precarious Age. I mean, it's turning this center periphery argument on its head. I mean, I think it was stone dead, I mean, by the middle of the 90s, this, still people go on about it. You know, actually, there's only one discourse in the art world, or five. And if you're not in that, you're just not cool, you're not worth looking at. It's not, you know, you're not, uh, I'm not interested, just not interested. My view for a long time has been that art is made all over the place. And this is the difference between the modern, or the modernist, and the contemporary. And that I mean, we live in a world you know, where, where, where you might have that beautiful painting by Modigliani and the can of shit. They're both modern art. And they're both in museums. So what's the difference between? Why is, why is that important? Why, why that not? So really, what I wanted to do was, uh, was to get away from a kind of progressive, positivist, modern history towards a more open field, which is the contemporary, which is now more or less... And contemporary means made now. Anything's contemporary. Anything can be an art if a can of shit, is it? The question is, is it any good? And that's the big question. And I'm very happy to devote my life towards trying to answer it so I can sleep at night and help others and get involved with arguments with others about it as well. Because it's the only thing. 
is this worth spending time on? If as a curator, you can't answer that question every day, maybe you should do something. So 453 works, so uh, you can read this. Over seven venues, about 40 from Australia and New Zealand, I think. Uh, and I think that's something about the Biennale, is that it, you're bringing things from outside, and it gives people who, from the region, a chance to measure up, if they can. I mean, you wouldn't put them in if they couldn't. And this is important, this kind of uh, broadening this playing field, broadening the field of what it is to be contemporary is very important. So some of the ideas that I had just kicking around, convicts, prisoners, first peoples, yes, definitely. Fourth worlds, very important for, for Australia. Of gods and ghosts, from the panopticon to the wunderkammer, yup. Again, moving around the enlightenment ideas. Hard rain, Bob Dylan, environment, and the trickster. We always leave room for him or her or it. So how colonial is a former colony? Seems to be a reasonable question. What does the difference between modern and contemporary? I've been rabbiting on about that. How much is good art a song of survival? Uh-huh. Okay. Wise folk and indigenous art made now not regarded as contemporary art. Well, I, I obviously think it should be. What can good mean in contemporary art? Yep. So the panopticon. Dear old Jeremy Bentham, who's stuffed corpse, you can still see in University College, London Main Hall, uh, invented this. He was in Belarus when he sent the ideas back to London. And the idea is that you have a, a, a prison in which a viewer is from one point in the center and see all the inmates. So it's a, it's a very elegant uh, development to the idea of the Grand Encyclopédie, another Enlightenment invention, uh, that two people can assemble a compendium of all knowledge. That all these you have a perspective, a perspective on all knowledge. And it's very dangerous. And at least with a Wunderkammer, which came before the rationalized view of the museum, you had a jumble. You had these cabinets of curiosity, and this curiosity could maybe give other kinds of knowledge. Anyway, there's Satchmo, and he came up with this great phrase, if all music is folk music, music is folk music, I ain't never heard no horse sing a song. All music is folk music, I ain't never heard no horse sing a song. Okay, swallow that, all arts folk art. But it was in Sydney in 2010. And we had one dead artist, a kind of regimental goat, who was Harry Everett Smith. You can see him there collecting some music from Northwest American Indians. He was a very young man. There he is as a mature artist, even a modernist, making these strange uh, uh, films. And then this is perhaps what he's remembered most for, American folk music and the compendium of folk music, which had a huge influence on... Uh, on a whole generation of, new, of pop musicians. And also his typography for this was a real inspiration for our catalogue and the whole style in which we did the, did the Biennale. And so what better to start with this story in Pier 1 2 with uh, The Ship of Fools by Paul McCarthy. Ship of Fools, Ship Adrift. There's a kind of early colonial experience and they're aiming their cannons on this, Christopher Pease, an artist from, uh, indigenous artist from Perth. Uh, not the Jasper Johns target, but the target of a very different kind with his version of an 18th century or early, 20, early 19th century engraving of first encounters. The Feast of Trimalchio, decadence, and uh, neo-colonialism in contemporary life. Cockatoo Island, a former prison and shipyard. What more ghosts could there be uh, that we have to deal with? And then this was in the main hall. A work which for Sai is about terrorism and about, in a sense, the, be the beautiful purity of such a crazy act, which is also 
transmuting into, into fireworks. It's like watching a disaster in slow motion. And then this work alongside it, or just in the next bay, by Kadaatia called Kasba, a kind of um, non-hierarchical work, would we'll say if you're using the, the language of the, uh, of the 1960s, and like a Carl Andre, you're encouraged to walk on it. By walking on it, you become part of the work. The work becomes activated. Yet this Kasbar is the, are the roofs of shanty towns. You are symbolically walking on the heads of the poor. Probably you are actually in one's existence anyway, in your choices of food, in our choices of food, in our choices of clothes anyway. Brooke Andrews, uh, War Memorial, Jumping Castle War Memorial. And the idea was um, only adults could go on this, and they had to sign uh, uh, an agreement. They knew the significance of, of jumping on this, because it's really on, the, on the, um, the tribal markings, but also, as you can see, the heads, decapitated heads of early revolutionary fighters are in the, in the turrets of the bouncy castle. And... Uh, so adults would be allowed to do it. No child would be allowed to go. This wasn't for fun. This was really a kind of moral test. But I think on the opening night, it really got the shit beaten out of it. And uh, we decided that no one would go on it. It would just be, a, as it is, a memorial. Hiroshi Sugimoto, in the same space that uh, uh, Yanagi Yukinori is uh, showing, is wonderful work this time. Robert McPherson's uh, uh, Chitters, a wheelbarrow for Richard. Kind of folk music, these uh, signs by the side of the road he's put together and constructed into this huge painting object. Mark Rollinger, we start into the singing now, his hymn, There's a Land for Little Children with hydrogen in his voice. Richard Grayson, uh, uh, actually a former uh, artistic director of the Biennale, very interesting artist and, and curator. And he did Handel's Messiah set to country and western music. We stuck that in the tunnel. Uh, Yota Castro from Peru. He had set uh, an outburst by then President Berlusconi of Italy uh, in the EU Parliament against a German saying that he was like a Nazi concentration camp guard. He took these words and put them in Italian opera to sing as if it, as if it was. Stodelat, uh, a Petersburg-based group, and this is their, their songspiel on, uh, on, on Perestroika. MCA, uh, Roxy Payne, Neuron, and John Bach. The fish great in Melkstand kips in Hohen Gleichnis Refugium. I don't think even Germans can't translate this, but... Uh, uh, again, this, this revisiting by artists is almost as if it's a, a kind of saw going back to the 18th century, going back to the early 19th century. These ideas, and of course this is very parodic of science and of, of now, it's always referring to now, but the, the, the need to, uh, to refer back to this costume. And of course Rodney Graham does this regularly, uh, city self, country self. And there we go, kick up the ass. And then it's, uh, you know, the dandy, there's the yokel, he gets it up the arse, and it continues time and time again. Rachel Nibone, and Angela Ellsworth. These are the seer bonnets, Mormon, early Mormon settlers, the kind of things that they wore made with pins. And um, they were, uh, all the pins were facing inwards. It was all very worrying and, and threatening objects. Fiona Paddington, the Maori artist from New Zealand, these wonderful photographs of Lafkais, life casts of, uh, of early leaders. Greg Graham, same kind of idea, of Maori's tattoos over objects of aggression. Bo Dick, who sadly passed away at the beginning of last year. And one of the ideas, and again, coming through here, I hope quite strongly, is that uh, from very early on, I think what Mick 
Vic Waterloo's uh, Biennale, he showed indigenous art as part of the Biennale, and it became regular thing, and, and it happened every time. They weren't left out. But it did seem to me that if, if, if you do it here in Australia, I mean, the, the world is full of indigenous people, and they all have culture. And it's crazy to leave that out as well. So I really wanted to include Maori, North American Indian, Southern American Indian, anyone else who I could find. Kent Monkman, he's Cree Irish, lives in Toronto. He's redoing these settlers' paintings of the uh, 19th century. But it's mischief eagle testicles, uh, the, the chap with the hat in the middle, who is this uh, uh, either transsexual or trans, uh, transvestite uh, Indian figure who seduces the settlers and kills them. But certainly one of the most impressive things in this Biennale was this selection of 110 funeral poles by 41 different artists from Northeast Arnhem Land, all made in the space of 11 years. And in this, you can see different artistic personalities, different artistic and aesthetic languages, and a whole range of views of the cosmos which they have. And they're real, they're based in their reality. And they bear no reference whatsoever to Western norms, but they're perfectly intelligible. And it was just magnificent to see these things together. Terry Stokes had collected them. And uh, it was <coughs> in this idea of, the, of, of there being many contemporaneities, it was a very important um, anchor. And from that, you went into this uh, room with the works by uh, Louise Bourgeois, and these are. Uh, Bronze casts are made from items of her clothing, which she sort of stretched and made into bodies of their own. The Chapman brothers, their take on ethnology, a typically sardonic one. And then Marcus Coates showing a, a South London shaman. He was performing in an art space, and art space was, uh, was a performance space, turned into a performance space as well as a gallery, and at weekends a club for the Biennale. So you could go and have drinks and hang out and also see performances. And Super Deluxe uh, performance space in Tokyo uh, came over and ran it for the whole length of the Biennale. Arai Rajaramanshuk uh, from Chiang Mai, uh, this was a work in which he put up these life-size replicas of famous paintings, and, uh, and the villagers criti critiqued them. So the videos uh, repeat their words about it, which are very wise, very straightforward. And you can, it gives a different perspective on, the, on these uh, Western art historical icons. Oclado de Coquea, um, a Mexican artist uh, who was really looking at the history of his own country in the 18th century, where with the increasing settlement, a uh, whole style of caster painting started, cast painting. And these were portraits, but they didn't have names. But they actually showed what if a, if a settler from Spain uh, married, a, uh, married a black slave, uh, you would get a mulatto. So there'd be no names, you'd get the child. And, and, and then you would have what happens if a half mulatto married such and such and the show. So it's like a, a series of computations. So he took these paintings, the idea of these paintings, and made his contemporary version. So you've got the queen with sitting bull, gives President Benito Juarez, the 19th century president of Mexico. And he continued this in various ways. Good way of decolonializing. Shen Xiaomin, uh, these were scattered around different venues in the Biennale, his tortured bonsais. Whoops. Liu Jianhua, upstairs here. Uh, in our gallery of New South Wales, we focused particularly on East Asia, on East Asian artists. Steve McQueen, his version of uh, uh, the Joseph uh, Conrad novel, The Terror, The Terror. Sun Wan and Pong Yu, the Hong Kong intervention project, uh, which is uh, looking at the Filipino workers, guest workers, and they gave each one a, uh, a, a toy hand grenade and the camera. And they would put the toy hand grenade in their favorite place and then take a photograph of it and then they would take a photograph of them, and this made a, there were hundreds of such displays. In this case, the dog gets it. Sometimes it's the child's playpen, sometimes the library, sometimes the sofa, 
It's kind of an interesting social uh, uh, document of uh, bourgeois Hong Kong households in 2010. Then Fiona Hall in the, uh, in the botanic gardens, barbarians at the gates, they have beehives in different national camouflage colors. And the idea is that we'd, we'd put in some foreign bees, but of course that was forbidden totally. So she just put the different foreign color, camouflage colors and each beehive was a, a building on the top which expressed that nation, nationality. We've got the Houses of Parliament there for England. And then uh, Choi jung Hua, a Korean artist, he made this wonderful uh, uh, installation in the cleavage of the, uh, of the opera house. So, jumping on two years to Kiev, and this is Maidan Square, which you'd have seen in the news where all the, the riots were a couple of years back, or maybe three years back now. And Cho jung Hua, again, in his 30 meter wide uh, golden lotus, which breathes, it goes up and then collapses. The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, a good Dickensian title, his novel about the French Revolution. They wanted Rebirth and Apocalypse, which I was happy enough to go along with, but they seemed to think that Rebirth and Apocalypse was right for their time, and they probably knew better than I did. That's the building, a late 18th century military building of about 30,000 square meters. 100 artists, 23 artists from the Ukraine, about 230 works, 40 specially commissioned. So these were a few ideas, I mean, which I was running with. They weren't critical, but I was running with them. But more important was the question of the Ukraine, what does post-Soviet mean? What is post-Soviet culture? Is it really post-Soviet? Does it just run on in a different uh, dress? And how does post-Soviet culture in Ukraine fit into the world. And I really wanted to break down those barriers regarding Ukraine as this Soviet cul-de-sac that ended at the Black Sea and then splurged on into Kazakhstan and um, Azerbaijan and all, all these other countries to the east. And to think back to the Silk Road, to the time when all those cultures were flowing freely across. So just a few quick pictures. That's Boris Mikhailov's sort of old Soviet industries, his photographs there. They'd uh, not really seen much from America, certainly no work from Louise Bourgeois. The only guy who was doing this in Kiev was Pinchuk, or still is Pinchuk, and uh, he certainly hadn't touched this. So there are three cells by Louise Bourgeois. These woods by Toyo Shigia. Shigeo, Toya Shigeo, um, 30, 30 pieces in all. Very, very strong Baroque carvings, um, reminiscent actually of Kamakura period uh, art, but also these you know, simple presences. They have a kind of Giacometti-like quality. Malishko Mikola, uh, a Ukrainian artist, quite senior, uh, Really interesting, working in wood, yet echoing constructivist ideas in his work. And then Phila de Barlow made a huge piece in response to what she saw on a visit there. It's another view of part of it, another view. And just by it was this uh, Stelios Phytakis, a Greek artist, and he was looking at uh, Ukrainian history, and particularly uh, Makno, the anarchist leader at the Civil, Civil War time, 1920-21, uh, who for a time looked as though he might win uh, against the Red Army. And so it's looking at that. It was buried history and by the Soviet time and by the new Ukrainian government. But also, Makhno probably was responsible for pogroms of many Jews as well. It seemed to be a, a, an appallingly popular sport in that part of the world. And the title of it, Pincer of Germany, Revolution of Makhno, takes the first letters of each, makes up pogrom. And in the other bay, uh, there's Babi Yar, the massacre of Babi Yar in the 40s. But in this orthodox style, and, and just across the road is the oldest cathedral in Russia, 
uh, where Christianity first entered Russia from Byzantium, from Constantinople. So the earliest uh, paintings in the style in Russia, just a, a stone's throw away. Ai Weiwei, I know all about that. This was his circle of animals. It's too long a story, but there's a very specific reason why that was there. Sergei Radkevich, who's a street artist, he uses aerosols, but sometimes he makes these strange, almost liturgical images. The hand, it could be in a church, the hand of God, or certainly something that I was referencing in the discussion about this uh, exhibition was the invisible hand, Adam Smith's The Invisible Hand, which is supposed to look after the market, but which obviously doesn't in a godless world. Vacheslav Akunov, uh, Caroline showed work by him earlier. This is his alley of superstars, so there's all gross politicians there, and you can grind your heel into their faces, and then there's a, a tower of, of matchboxes. These are, again, political figures on these matchboxes in a Stalinist structure. Volker de Jong, shooting at Watu, he's a uh, Dutch artist who is... Uh, uh, uses history, the privateering history of 17th century Holland, to comment very much on, on the condition of capitalism in the current day. Uh, Yin Shu Zhen, a Chinese artist. Uh, these are weapons, they're like rockets hung high in the, in the roof, but they're made of household implements and covered with, with knitwear and uh, uh, women's clothes. Miwa Yanagi, this is four meters high. There were five of them, uh, the old girls' troop. These strong kind of goddess-like figures that tower over you, and they, partly their bodies are kind of young and strong and fit and firm, but also they're old and wizened. So you have this impact of the two, of the old and the young in the same body. Some people got terribly upset about this. Almogul Melnibayeva from Kazakhstan. It's a five-channel uh, video installation about uh, Semipalatinsk, the former Soviet test site. She's going back and interviewing people who remember it. It's rather like in El Alamos. You know, they told you put a paper bag over your head and everything will be fine. And so they're, they're reminiscing about, about this, so it's documentary, part documentary. But also there's this kind of mythic element going on in between. These earth spirits, Kazakh earth spirits, which are called peri, same name you get from the Persian sprites, god, goddesses, who sort of intersect with the Soviet past in different ways. Song Dong, I think we saw another work by Song Dong just a moment ago. Uh, this is a, a series of works, The Wisdom of the Poor, not the whole work, it's a huge work, but the idea that he looks at the life of people in the hutongs in Beijing which are being torn down, torn away, and he uses these materials to make new constructions about the wisdom of the poor. And that is, uh, what we're looking at is how uh, a courtyard with a tree growing in it has been turned into some kind of drawing room for someone. Or here, this is a pigeon loft built on the top of a house. They all love pigeons for racing and eating. And then underneath it, there's a bed. And then he gets involved with the, with the traditional Chinese art, Sansui, the art of mountains, water, and air, the kind of things that you can see upstairs in the oriental section here. And this is his version of the mountains, made with, with, uh, with windows from the, from the old hutongs. Makoto Aida, he's running in the same idea, a Japanese artist. It's called Ash-Colored Mountains. As you get closer, you can see it's made up of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dead salarymen and their equipment. Lam Tung Pang from Hong Kong, his take using different styles, chapbooks for teaching traditional Chinese painting, he's made up this landscape, which is based on fact. Shirazeh Hushari, Persian artist living in London. Chapman's again, can't uh, resist them really. In this, they're showing their, ex their version of degenerate art. And uh, they imagine that uh, the, the art that they, they really liked, the degenerate stuff, was the stuff that was official Nazi art. 
And the art that they really liked was uh, uh, heavy metal uh, sculpture from the 1970s. So it's a, it, it's a very cruel joke. It's made even crueler by the fact that uh, for two years in World War II, Ukraine was occupied by Nazi forces. And so the, they were walking in the streets here. Jitish Kalat from India, his work, Cover Letter. It's a projection, a projection on, a, on a water screen of a letter written by Gandhi to Adolf Hitler in 1939, saying that, you know, really, you will not go to war. It's really pointless and unproductive. And please do reconsider your ideas and behave. Of course, he didn't get an answer. Vasil Skolov, um, and this is looking at the post-Soviet idea in Ukraine art, uh, a kind of new version, new punk version of socialist realism. And it's called The Spectre of Revolution, a quote from the Communist Manifesto. Spectre of Revolution is haunting Europe. And there it is, it's geriatrics running down the, down the road with bags of money, chasing dollars with their pitchforks and, and pikes, and there's, and there's skeletons amongst them. And then this pathetic little bit of traditional Euro Ukrainian embroidery painted as a strip along the side. Very, very sardonic. But socialist realism spread also to China. In 1955, Konstantin Maximov was invited to go from Moscow to Beijing Central Academy to teach the Chinese how to paint properly. I mean, all this old stuff was no longer any good. They were, they were a communist state. They really had to buckle down and, okay, they have folk art, but they needed some good, strong socialist realism. So it spread virally in China over the space of about three years, this style, and it fed it right into the Cultural Revolution, and it's still affecting Chinese artists, although in a very uh, parado paradoxical way, as here with Wei Dong, a mixture of a sort of 17th century European painting and socialist realism, maybe. Or this, Zhou Shishi, China, 1946 to 1949, Liberate Beiping. I mean, this is based on a famous painting of that time uh, that uh, was made in China. So that there's that link as well. It's not just the Silk Road and uh, exoticism coming west. There was Western stuff going east and socialist realism uh, and Marx going over to China, to modern China, to form modern China. Mao Chao Shun, the new school of Athens, his version of Raphael with himself replicated right throughout it. That's five meters wide. Wang Ching Song, his view of liberty, the goddess, uh, with Chinese scaffolding all around it and wearing a kind of Mao jacket. I think this very much has something to do with the fact that the, within international capitalism, the American national debt is largely owned by... Uh, China, or China, owns a huge part of the American national debt. What this means, I have no idea, but it is true. And then this, just looking, finding people in Lvov, uh, which is now called Lviv, which used to be part of USSR, which used to be part of Poland, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and is now part of the Ukraine. This guy working in a basement on old carpets makes these incredible paintings. Very odd. Well, Stasva Lysovsky, uh, in another part of uh, uh, Ukraine, he's making what he calls chanson art, uh, referring to folk ballads, these old bardic ballads from Ukraine, um, and very often very crude and pornographic elements in them, uh, and criticisms of contemporary politics. Nikita Kardan, a very young Ukrainian artist who is, um, who is really uh, showing pre police procedures, contemporary police procedures for um, asking them to uh, 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 getting information out of them. And uh, he's showing these torches and has illustrated the descriptions. Kenji Yanobi, blue cinema in the woods, a uh, Japanese artist who was obsessed by nuclear power, of course mainly appalled by it, but also fascinated by it. He'd gone to Chernobyl and made work there, 
but also in Japan himself. He's making work about nuclear power, the dangers of it. That's his father in the film uh, with this ventriloquist dummy, which is like uh, one of these characters. And Vin uh, Poulet from Vietnam, sound and fury, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This is the Ho Chi Minh mausoleum, really looking how the government in Vietnam has become a kleptocracy. He lives in Vietnam but refuses to show his work there, not surprisingly, because he'd be arrested. Kosama, an old friend who I've been working with since the early 80s. And Bill Viola, the raft. Uh, a terrible disaster occurs, but slowly people get up and stand. How are we for time? Five minutes, okay. Right. We'll get a crack on. 2014, a time for dreams. So this is the fourth Moscow Biennale of young artists. And what better? I have a dream. Young artists, what should you have? You should have a dream. Put the whole life before you. I was a teenager, I think 13 or 12, when, uh, when he made this speech. Absolutely critical. It still is. And this was a time of resurgent Stalinism in Russia and repression elsewhere. It was the beginning of what has become worse. 84 artists, 30 different countries. And it was from open submission. And I added in people I was interested in as well. But I looked at 3,000 open submissions. So just to reference a little bit of Soviet art, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. A young Moscow-based artist. This is Stalinist. This isn't German artist. These are people who went missing, young people who went missing in the USA. Lesitsky. Zip group. It's their observation tower. And they make a zone of civil dissent. So they made part of it here. That's for demonstrating in. So you can shuffle forward and the policeman can't hit you on the head. These are the sketches for them. And then that's showing how it all works. You have your demonstration things and you have your observation power. Tarkovsky. This rather romantic reconstructions of buildings being destroyed in the north of Russia. Kazakhstan. From Thailand, a young Japanese Thai artist, her take on Ukraine, her dreams. A work uh, called The Administration, uh, uh, done by a young Russian artist, and he put the sign up in a block of flats and said, uh, according to data from observations and carrying in your housing estates, People of non-traditional sexual orientation, gays, lesbians, have been identified in your part of the building. So it basically says, these can corrupt you, they might be pretending to be something else, but they will take your inner moral fiber, and be vigilant. And if you suspect anyone of propagating homosexuality, immediately inform the district representatives, and then they gave the local town mayor's number. So the mayor starts getting rung up by all sorts of people. Some people are complaining, how dare you? You know, this is completely impossible. These people do what they like, They're completely free. Others said, oh, there's a number flat number. What are you going to watch them? Yeah. So, so it was a complete brouhaha, and the press got hold of it. And so the press go on the outside of, whoops, go on the outside of that, and then the TV get hold of it, and all the TV interviews on that. So it was a kind of very nice intervention at a time when it's getting violent and more violent and violent. Ivan Chabrovsky, this is a kind of video which came out of a, of a tableau. And these are based on newspaper photographs of violence, usually against LGBTQ people. Recycle group, Keys of Paradise, the uh, worship of objects in the supermarket. Oh, gigantic uterus man, yes. Um, Lu Yang, young artist from Shanghai, make this film about uterus man. Here she's got the ovum light wave and then her vagina attack and baby weapon, all these different things. This superhero 
Whoa, blood energy altitude flying. <laughs> Chen Zhou, spanking the maid from an American novella. Uh, a guy working out in a, in a gym with a banana, an inexplicable banana there and a fake orgasm. Li Ran, he acts in all his films. This one is based on a Soviet film he saw as a child uh, about a commissar. Sun Chun, uh, who is... Um, there's a wonderful show of him at White Rabbit at the moment. Great show of his paintings. Please see it. This is an animated film, uh, and it was banned in Shanghai very recently. It's about the Cultural Revolution. Heba Abin, about the Arab Spring in, uh, in uh, Cairo and how it imploded. Eric Pans, American uh, Farsi uh, Persian artist, Dream a little dream. I never talk about the war again. This is a Bosnian war. video. It lasts nearly 10 minutes. They keep on saying the same thing. I'm just going to scroll through them now. Daniel Boyd. And Isaac Chung. I had lost faith in mankind. One day I decided to go to Buchenwald with this guy. And once inside the camp, he kissed me and helped me find the oak tree. Then I knew there was hope, for I'd just experienced human war, where I'd least expected it. So, you ended with love. So will I. The pleasure of love, transient emotion in contemporary art. I'm not going to show any photographs with it, but it was the the last Biennale I did in Belgrade in uh, 2016, and it was looking at a, at a proposition. There's a song, Le Plaisir d'Amour. This is what was based on it. Le plaisir d'amour ne reste qu'un moment, le chagrin de, de l'amour dure toute la vie. The pleasure of love rests only a moment, but the grief of love spreads your whole life through. I don't agree with that. Um, but it's a great way of normalizing misery. And if you like, this look of transient emotion in contemporary art was also critiquing the idea of normalizing misery. Remember, it's in Belgrade, Serbia. It used to be the capital of former Yugoslavia. A magical time. I first went there in 1966. A tragic place, the building in which uh, I was working Oops, sorry, last slide. It was a former military academy. Next to it was still the, the damage by NATO bombs, which had been dropped in the 1990s. Genocide, the worst kind of fratricide and sororicide had happened there. They deserved at least the pleasure of love. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline and David. It has been such a rich um, experience of sharing um, the starting from Caroline's uh, composting idea, but it's so fertile that their knowledge uh, of philosophy and then also history, social uh, political histories, that makes the experience of Biennale just so, um, so uh, enriched with all these uh, uh, knowledges. But uh, we have actually 10 minutes <laughs> so uh, I would really like to open up the question from you uh, to ask um, any questions that you would like to um, ask them to elaborate a little bit more. Overwhelmed? <laughs> 
I might I might ask you one question because both of you had uh, worked in the museum and making museum exhibition, but also so many biennales. And uh, but both of you also has very grand ideas and the knowledges. And I was just wondering if that makes it different if it's biennale or museum exhibition uh, to curate something. <clears throat> well, I, I think it, if it's a biennale, biennale, you're probably traveling to it as an outsider. Um, though that's often the case with other exhibitions as well. Um, and I think that particularly with a biennale, you have to take an acknowledgement of where you are. I mean, I think that's very important. And as they take place only every two years, I think it's important that they're rooted more or less in the present. I mean, I know there's a kind of, I mean, say the most recent documenter, there's a kind of feeling of giving everyone a history lesson by showing lots of older things. But for me, anyway, that's, there's a time and place for things and the Biennale isn't that place for it. But. I don't really have an answer because I haven't thought about the question too much. Let me think. The question is, what is the difference between a, organizing a Biennale and what an exhibition in a museum? Um, well, there's a question of scale in my experience. Generally, periodic international exhibitions have been more spread out in different venues, experimenting different places that are often non-conventional uh, for art exhibiting sites without climate control. Mm. The works are not as valuable generally, so you don't have to have so much, I mean, you have to have security and so forth, but it's not the same as what an insurance company will ask for in terms of works that are already more, have more value. I mean, these are banalities, but I'm brainstorming out loud. Mm -hmm. I think in my work, what I've brought to international periodic exhibitions has been a little bit of the museological, and what I've brought to the museum work has been a little bit of that um, improvisation of the temporary international exhibitions. So it's made both a little better, maybe, uh, because most in periodic international exhibitions I see are not really grounded in a vision that is thinking about the structure and the format. It's been, they're more about let's find a theme and let's find the artists. Whereas I think that a little bit of work around the structure of it as a semiological construction in itself, like a clock <laughs> in itself, can give a good little bit of depth, and vice versa. The, I mean, the museum is not really about exhibitions, you know. I mean, I do exhibitions, but solo exhibitions. I mean, the the, the group exhibition in the museum I've, I have done, like colori or faces in the crowd. But. For me, it's been more associated with solo survey, large retrospective exhibitions, working with an artist on how you can look at back at a, a caractère rétrospectif, like the large retrospective with William Kentridge that toured a lot, or with Pierre Huyghe that we did, or you know. So I, I associate that work. Mm, more with the solo exhibition. And then the museum is more, for me, a continuous work. Mm -hmm. So one thinks about all the programs and the way that they all connect over a, many, many years. Mm -hmm. So I suppose this is just like kitchen answer. Mm -hmm. But anyway. But I think it's interesting. Um, yes, from the audience. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, Carolyn, um, you, you spoke about love. Um, what is the relationship or the relation between doing um, a lecture on love and, and doing an exhibition? <laughs> Interesting. When I was asked to be a candidate for the Documenta, first of all, I almost hung up the phone because it was the day, bef day after that woman who was going to become a Republican candidate coming from Alaska. She had um, been tricked by a Canadian radio station in thinking that it was the president of France that had called her and wanted to go hunting with her. So the day after I got this, you know, telephone call, wollen Sie ein Kandidat für die Dokumente Leiterin sein? And I was in New York and it was August. And I just hung up a phone and said, you know, send me an email. But of course it took them two weeks to find my private email address because it's very confidential. So you don't just call the museum and ask Castello di Rivoli, can I have Christoph Bakarchiev's phone num uh, email, they, they can't do that for confidentiality. So after finally two weeks of searching, I get the email and it, it uh, two weeks of their searching for the email. Got the email and it came from the domain of Documenta. So I then believed it. And the whole process started, which was a very long process of um, three essays that had to be written, no concept to give for the documenta, but three essays. And one was about um, what is documenta for? And that was very useful because it made me study the whole history of documenta to write it. And the second was what was your methodology? And the third was, the third essay was what is necessary? So the third essay, basically I wrote that um, Nothing is necessary, not even life on the planet. And therefore, the correct question is what is to be done. So it was an argument between what is necessary and what is to be done. But the second one, which was what is your methodology? And I had never thought about methodology, or my own methodology, because I usually look at what is the methodology of a certain artist or a certain movement or a certain filmmaker or not, but not this inward gaze that never occurred to me. And then I realized, writing that essay, that there's a kind of um, Freudian sublimation into the making of the exhibition. So it's a displacement of, um, of a, it's a kind of, for me, a displacement of a relationship, a, a, a form of love. So that, I suppose, uh, made me start to think around 2000 and, um, what was it? I don't know, 2008 or nine when I started the project, right after Sydney, uh, about do, do, banal things, but that kind of question, which has to do with the sublimation as well in, in cultural practice. I mean, Freud would call it sublimation. This is a silly, simple answer, but that is... Um, I then always saw the exhibitions that I've done as f forms of displaced love. Of course, to speak about that now in the era of Me Too, and I'm not surprised, could be very tricky, because um, if I were a man saying that would be very problematic. But I'm not, thank God. <laughs> and and um, I'm very happy there's this Me Too movement, and I'm not surprised. I mean, to take advantage to say I'm very, very supportive of it and very, very happy that it's happening because it has allowed this question to emerge of the power relations um, between the genders. So my question, you know, with love is how can love exist without there ever being a power relation play, you know? So that is what I think about in this question of fragility and failing. Thank you. So next question. Thank you both very much uh, for your talks this morning. Both of you um, are Northern Hemisphere based curators and 
both um, inherent to your concept for the exhibition was the idea of distance or being upside down, coming to the southern part of the world. And my question is what, in a nutshell, um, how has that experience of curating the Sydney Biennale impacted on your practice as curators and has your view of curating in this part of the world or for this part of the world changed as a result of that experience? Yes, certainly. I, I think um, it's the first time that I worked um, for an extended period of time in a, in a colony. Um, and this made a very big difference um, in that it really got me to research specifics about Australia and New Zealand and, and talk with people about their different perspectives of it, whether they be, whatever origin they may be, including indigenous. And uh, I mean, I had traveled before, uh, since I think 92, when uh, Leon Parisian and Bernice Murphy invited me first to come and have a look. And I'd come back on several occasions and I'd been lucky enough to spend time with communities up in the north. Um, but it really did, um, enable me to, to get to grips with, um, with the real situation, rather seeing it as a theoretical model of, of, uh, of colonization and then decolonization. But really, um, you know, what, what do you do? These are real questions, and I don't think I'm here to tell anyone what they should do, and art certainly won't tell anyone what they should do. But what does it express? And it does express, for me, I mean, I'm talking about art in this region, a whole lot of unfinished business. Um, and, you know, it, and rightly too, you know, that's where it is. So there is a kind of, there, there is a wound, there's a, there's a neurosis here, which is really both creative but also festering. And, uh, you know, it, you're not alone. I mean, we, individually, we're like that too, <laughs> wherever we come from. But, uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's like a big question. <laughs> it's one of those self questions that I don't usually pose. Um, Surely, some very fundamental things did change. I mean, I became more knowledgeable <laughs> of issues that here had been discussed for quite a long time. So, uh, it was a learning curve. <laughs> for example, um, I made friends here. <laughs> Uh, for example, Hetty Perkins became quite a good friend. Um, maybe Nakamaras, maybe sisters. Uh, although we don't see each other that, that often, but she did come to Castle and we worked together on that. And my, our daughters are friends, uh, although they also lead lives that are in different places of the world. Um, these friendships, well, it was a, it, I mean, it, there are some very banal things that for you are obvious, but for me are not obvious. I mean, when I arrived here, I did um, believe that, hmm, this is like, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with fire now, how to, how to um, not be misunderstood and not be lacking delicacy and so forth, how to say it. All our knowledges are situated. My knowledges are situated. I'm a woman from a uh, background half Italian and half Bulgarian, um, born in the US, grew up, went to university in Pisa, uh, particular backgrounds. Uh, okay, Mediterranean, say, culture, which is why I always find very simplistic the critique of Eurocentricism, it seems the silliest thing on planet Earth, 
because when you are in Euros, Europe, you realize it's so complex and we are on the south of Europe, so we're too south to be north and too north to be south, so kind of cut out of uh, global discourses uh, as Portugal and Spain and Greece and a certain latitude, let's say, of the world. Having been also at the heart of one of the empires, which is the Roman Empire, uh, the politics and transactions in the Mediterranean for thousands of years in, inform mm, the way that I see issues of power in general. So that said, when I came here, I did feel that there was a forced, um, a forced within the white community in Australia, a kind of forced political correctness that um, had incorporated, for example, since you're speaking about indigenous practices, had incorporated in the museums, in their museums, in their discourses, this broadening of um, what is art uh, to incorporate and to rewrite modernisms according to a vaster way of thinking. However, I found it uh, forced and not sincere because most of the curators were not indigenous curators um, and this operation, let's say, as an operationality had occurred through a very, very traditional idea of what art is in the highest bourgeoisie in Europe, which is that it's about form and beauty and things like that, which are the worst kind of reaction, reactionary way of thinking in, in, in the tradition that I had been shaped in. So I found this very paradoxical, that there was such a conservative approach to incorporating something that was being incorporated as a radical breaking of some Eurocentric model. Like, we had abstract art here for thousands of years. What? You know, well, what is this? Why is abstract art a value per se? You know, why should we aspire to look as, as, as good as Paul Klee? Who cares, you know, about Paul Klee or abstract art in a way? So, um, through Hedy and the relationship with her and going to various communities, um, I changed my mind on the operationality of this uh, breaking of the boundary, uh, but more in terms of using that art as... I mean, I, I don't care about art, honestly, I, I really don't. I don't believe that art exists. I believe that it is a concept of the Enlightenment that has then been used to reread cultural practices for since the cave paintings in Northern Africa or in Lascaux. But it's a concept that nobody had in the West. And I mean, the, 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 this concept, even though Vasari writes the lives of the artists, but is more like uh, craft in Europe, this concept. The, the, there wasn't the artist until the, it begins only with the Renaissance a little bit, just a little bit, and mainly is a concept of the Enlightenment that then, that then is applied to all of Europe. So basically this Western idea of art is only an idea that is 300 years old. Uh, it wasn't, and it has nothing to do with what the cathedrals were or what Giotto was doing. It has nothing to do with that. So it's a rereading of the past. So that said, and my wanting to look at the c cultural creativities of all life on the planet, it, it, to me, to, to say we, want, we need to broaden this category and include other concepts of art is, is still very limited. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the civilizations of, of rocks and the universe and so on. So therefore, I happen by chance to be in this thing we call the art system, but I don't really care about this boundary for me compared to any other activity that's interesting, like quantum physics or anything, 
or, or shoemaking. So that said, <laughs> um, what I found very interesting and what I find still very interesting is um, how things can then operate. And, and so I remember a conversation where uh, someone said to me, you know, oh, you know, it's, this is just a short period, 200 years, 300 years. We have a lot of time. You know, it's like, we just have to wait it out. Okay, that sounds very good to me, very revolutionary and very good. Secondly, I, someone else said to me, well, you know, this money, uh, we use it to get the dialysis center. And, oh, I thought social sculpture, you know, social sculpture, Joseph Boyce, and it occurred to me that it wasn't clear who was using who, you know, and, and therefore within this broader frame of the flourishing of life on the planet, my horizons opened and I became more uh, questioning of the uh, superficiality of the post-colonial paradigm that had been written by the colonial powers, basically. I mean, post-colonial thinking comes out of uh, universities that are certainly uh, mainly in places that had colonies like England and uh, so I look at this post-colonial theory also as a kind of power structure in itself. Uh, everything for me is power structure and needs to be taken apart. Uh, so this um, coming here helped me to understand how to take apart what was the new power system, I think, even in Australia, which is the power system of the post-coloniality, strangely enough. I mean, I, I don't know how to explain. And I do think that, that I came across a society that is more um, thinking about these questions because, like you said, more, th I think you said, more, more articulate in thinking about these questions than where I usually spent my life, which is Italy, and at the same time, a society that thinks it has solved a problem, but it hasn't solved a problem. I mean, if you start to say you're sorry, I would say that it's the beginning of approaching the problem, and there is no solution to the problem that is so simple, given that there's no rich person in this country that's Aboriginal, not one. You know, I don't believe that there's one Rich person. And, and so there's something fundamentally wrong with the, the economic and legal structure here, I think, uh, in concerning mining areas and land, land, land. So, uh, but, I, but I think also that, that I Italy has no lesson to teach anybody because there's horrors in the history of even modern Italy, I mean, the whole, all relations with Somalia and Ethiopia, and, and we have horrible um, un, unjustness in, in Italy, and um, um, certainly, you know, th there's no, no, I'm not speaking from a position of someone who thinks that our society has, is, is less racist or less, but, but I did find a lot of racism here that, I mean, I found that, for example, there was a hierarchy that it seemed to me that the indigenous aboriginals were seen in a certain hierarchy almost as lower than you know um, immigration i mean there seemed to be a whole hierarchy you know of like pacific people from pacific. so so i was shocked and saddened but also made many friends and was very welcomed and welcomed also by people of all descents and all backgrounds here and I found here a kind of essence of the issues at stake, the, the difficulties of um, human society's encounter. And uh, my thinking is always that the only way you can s uh, further this is to get out of the, um, how do you say, anthropocentrism, the, the specificity and superiority of the human to the rest, if you can get out of the, the only looking at in a Marxist or non-Marxist perspective, this too much centered onto the human, then if you can get out, suddenly there might be a better point of view that can bring more, um, more life. And I have only one a priori, only one, 
and it is that it is worthwhile that there be more life and not less life on yeah. the planet. That's all. I, I have no other a totally. priori. <laughs> I, um, I think we can't talk of post-colonial. We're not post-colonial anywhere. The colonial mindset is still there. And just know that we're no more postmodern. And a lot of people, particularly academics, but others have been making a living out of being postmodern and postcolonial. And we have linguistic wars as well as economic wars and we physical wars going on. And we have to give clarity. And whatever we do, whether we're working as curators or artists or um, in whatever field, the clearer we are, the more easy it is to live together. I couldn't agree more, Caroline. Life, life force, looking at art, however horrible it may be in its subject matter, it actually makes you feel that life, you're on the side of life and they're on the side of life. Yeah, it's a good note. Thank you. I hope this satisfies your question. <laughs> and I would love to continue this discussion, but unfortunately I have to close the morning session and this uh, archive story series. Thank you very much, Thank Caroline you. and David, for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much for...